So now we're going to have a whole session uh, talking about solar. And once again, as we've been trying to stress throughout this morning and, and this afternoon and what you've seen in the exhibits, is that each one of our wonderful renewable resources actually is a combination of a host of technologies and applications which creates uh, a wonderful opportunity in terms of thinking about how this means different kinds of, of applications, jobs, manufacturing, uh, how we can use these different resources in many different ways across every section of our country. And of course, we're really blessed here in the United States with an abundance of renewable energy in terms of all the, reno the host of renewable uh, resources. And we certainly are blessed with a lot of solar. And so to kick off our discussion this afternoon about solar, we are so glad to have Roan Resch, who is the president and CEO of the Solar Energy Industries Association. Roan? Thank you very much, Carol, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I want to start off by just kind of a quick show uh, of hands, because sometimes it's difficult for us when we come into a panel like this to, to know, uh, you know who our audience is and, 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 frankly, your education level on the technology. So just a real quick show of hands. How many people here are staffers working uh, for members of Congress? Anyone? Okay. Uh, how many? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, they've gone home, exactly. Um, uh, second, so how many people are here from the media? Okay, only one. All right, so we, we can we can get a little edgy yeah, right. here, guys, sure. as a panel. We don't have to hold back too much. Um, and, and the last question is, how many people? Actually, the second last question: How many people here currently have solar on their home? All right. Oh, great. One, two, three, Good four, question. five, six. That's great. Seven. So we have thirty-five potential customers in the room. I, I think that's exactly <laughs> right. So I'm just going to assume that everybody else wants to have solar on your house, and that's why you're here. Um, which is a great thing because it, it is an incredible technology. And, and before I kind of go into the details of, of what happened in 2009 and, and really what we hope to happen in 2010, I just want to talk a little bit about what is the solar industry because I think Carol did a really good job in, in uh, teeing up a conversation that we're more than just one technology. I think when people think of solar, they tend to think of photovoltaics. And photovoltaics are panels that directly convert sunlight to electricity. It's, it's the kind of uh, technology that most of us are employing on our homes today. However, there's, speak up, oh sure, sorry, I'll just move it a little bit closer. Um, and the second technology is called solar water heating. And these are panels that are used to heat up water for cooking, cleaning, showering, those kinds of things. They can also be used for industrial purposes as well. And in fact, Fenway Park employs uh, solar water heating panels on their stadium in order to provide about 60% of the hot water needs for that facility. And then the third is called concentrating solar power, or CSP. And concentrating solar comes in a couple of different forms, one of which is uh, uh, concentrating photovoltaics, where you're using basically a mirror to focus the sunlight, magnifying it up to 200 times on a very small uh, solar chip, and then getting very high outputs from that solar chip. Uh, and then the other is called solar thermal. And this, these are utility scale power plants that focus the sunlight either using parabolic mirrors, right, so the curved mirrors to focus the sunlight on a receiver tube, which then heats up oil and generates steam, or using uh, a power tower in which you're using heliostats or mirrors out in a field all pointed at one central location at great, very high temperatures, again, to generate steam and to run a standard uh, power block. Uh, there's a couple of examples of these technologies back in the expo hall, so I hope you have a chance to go take a look at them uh, before you leave today. But what I wanted to do first is talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the solar industry because it's pretty darn exciting. Uh, 2009, even though we were in a deep recession in this country, was a record year for solar in the United States. Uh, the solar electric industry grew by over 38% in the United States. Uh, revenue grew by over 36%. And uh, manufacturing continued to grow in the United States with new plants coming online in Michigan, in, Washington, uh, in Oregon, in Texas, in Georgia, in North Carolina, and other states. And so what we've seen is that solar continues to grow in the United States, driven in large part by both federal as well as state policy. But what we're seeing increasingly is an adoption um, of the technology itself by all sectors. So when I talked about growth 38% in 2009, the residential market 
those who put solar up on, on their homes, grew by over 100 percent in 2009. And I'll be curious to hear from, from Tony if they had a similar experience uh, with Standard in, in this last year. The utility scale sector, and this is focused just on photovoltaics here, but the utility scale sector for photovoltaics grew by over 200 percent. So we saw uh, a, a massive growth in those particular sectors. Now, the, the commercial, the interesting question is, okay, well then how's the entire industry only growing by 38 percent? Well, <laughs> the math does add up, believe it or not. Um, and if you go to our website, we have the See a Year in Review, or you can go to our, um, our booth over there and pick up the Year in Review to see more information. But basically, the commercial market was relatively flat. These are the big box stores, the Home Depots, the Lowe's, the, the you know, Targets, those kinds of stores where you've seen a lot of solar in the last couple of years. And the reason why is because the business model that was used in that particular sector is called the Power Purchase Agreement is reliant in large part on having a tax equity investor, somebody who has tax liability to come in as an investor in the project who will get a rate of return and can utilize and monetize the tax credits. If you're a startup business or you don't have substantial amounts of revenue, you can't really use a 30 percent tax credit for the, your project, so you need to bring in that third-party investor. And between 2007 and 2009, the number of tax equity investors in the United States went from 27 down to 3. And the amount of money available for investing in renewable energy projects, this isn't just solar, this is solar, wind, geothermal, everybody, um, dropped by about 90 percent. So all of a sudden, there really was no available tax equity to invest in these renewable energy projects. So the commercial market actually went down just by a few megawatts, but it was flat. And this is the largest sector of the solar industry. Um, the, the good news, if there, you know, if there is one, is that uh, this was recognized by the administration and by Congress and reflected in the Recovery Act. When uh, the, the Recovery Act was passed, they took the investment tax credit and converted it into a grant program at the Treasury Department. And that grant program basically uh, removes that tax equity investor. There's no additional cost to the government. It just basically creates flexibility in how the projects were financed. Uh, that program did not come online until August of this last year. So we saw a large increase in commercial projects towards the end of the year, and certainly that growth has continued into 2010. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I guess the question is, um, you know, how, how much did we install and where does that put us in kind of the global um, competitiveness uh, uh, position? So in, um, again, we in total installed in the United States about 480 megawatts in 2009. Just to give you a perspective, um, so we were 480. Uh, Germany installed about 3,000 megawatts. Uh, Italy, 700 megawatts. Japan, 484 megawatts. So we were in fourth place. Not too bad. We'd, you know, I'd like to get ahead of Japan and certainly you know, take on Germany at some point. But we're, we're moving in the right direction. The interesting thing is to look at uh, new capacity per capita. The country that installed the most solar per capita was actually the Czech Republic, 40 watts per person. Germany came in second at 36, and we go all the way down the line. The United States came in 10th place at 1.6 watts per person. I mean, what is 1.6 watts? I mean, that, that, uh, I guess one little LED's worth of solar for everybody. I mean, it's it's it, it, it's it's fairly pitiful, to be honest with you. And and it, I think it shows a need of of how we need to continue to expand. Um, uh, let's just say awareness as well as policies that support the growth of solar. And that's certainly what we want to do um, uh, going forward. In 2010, we we fully anticipate the market to uh, to double. Uh, the Treasury grant program uh, has worked extremely well. Um, uh, projects throughout the entire solar sector are continuing to grow both in number as well as in size. So when I talked a little bit about that, that utility scale market growing, uh, actually 200 percent growth this last year, there's now 21,000 megawatts in the pipeline of utility scale projects. So again, we installed 480 megawatts this last year. There's 21,000 under development. And these are the, what we call the legitimate projects, those that have either signed a power purchase agreement or have you know, the land already uh, and are developing the projects uh, in a fairly senior manner. Um, and that includes both concentrating solar, solar thermal, as well as uh, photovoltaics. Uh, but we're also seeing that the, the market continue to grow in the residential side. You're seeing more and more electricians get into the business. People who've been let go by the housing industry are finding new careers 
new entire career opportunities in the solar industry. And these are plumbers, these are roofers, these are electricians. I mean, Tony can tell the story about who he's hiring. But you know, if you think about the downturn in the economy and you look at the, the housing stock that has been abandoned in places like Nevada, they've gone through a, a building boom over the last decade. There's a lot of people out of work. So we can put those people back to work in solar, and that's certainly what you're starting to see uh, happen. What I want to just, just pivot very quickly on, and, and then my time is up, is to talk a little bit about policy, because policy is a major part of the solar industry today. Um, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but the solar industry doesn't exist in a meaningful way without uh, policy. Now, you can say that pretty much about any energy technology. And when you step back and look at the oil industry, they've enjoyed incentives since 1916, permanent incentives since 1916, the coal industry since the 30s, the nuclear industry since the mid-50s. Uh, we didn't get our tax credits until the 2005 energy bill, and then they created a two-year tax credit and capped it at $2,000. So you really can't build an industry on something that's around for two years and capped at two grand. Uh, thankfully, we've gotten that extended out through 2016, and it's a true 30% tax credit for both commercial as well as residential. So things are, are, are looking up. They're not permanent by any means, and certainly we, we are not nearly as subsidized as the oil and gas industry. Just to give you um, a, a quick data point, uh, between 2003 and 2008, the uh, oil and gas industry received about $70 billion in direct incentives from the federal government. In that same time frame, the solar industry received less than $1 billion, and overall renewable electricity received less than $5 billion. And so when you start to look at the inequities about where we're using our taxpayers' dollars to advance energy and environmental policy, right now it's flipped on its head. Right now, we are prioritizing the use and subsidizing oil, gas, and coal to a much greater extent than we are renewables. I don't mind that we're subsidizing them, but we need a level playing field. We need to recognize that ultimately you need to build solar, you need to build wind and geothermal and hydro, and those clean energy technologies that are carbon-free, that improve the economic stability in this country and create new opportunity, and that they're domestic. And, you know, one of the best things about my job is the fact that, you know, the, the, the places where new manufacturing are occurring isn't just California. It's Michigan. It's Ohio. It's Pennsylvania. It's Tennessee. It's those states that need those manufacturing jobs the most. So before Carol gives me the hook, I'm going to just give uh, one quick policy ask. This is our biggest ask. I talked a little bit about the Treasury Grant Program. This program is actually working, and it's working extremely well. Um, we just released a study that shows a two-year extension of the Treasury Grant Program will create another 65,000 jobs here in the United States. This is a program that's basically taking a tax credit and making and providing more flexibility on how it's used. So it doesn't cost the taxpayer more than the administrative cost, about $5 million a year, uh, uh, according to CBO. But what that does is it creates 65,000 new jobs all throughout the United States and will keep an industry that's been growing continuing to grow. But without that Treasury grant program, we certainly face a downturn um, uh, in the years ahead. So with that, I thank you for your patience and indulgence, and I uh, look forward to answering your questions. And now we are going to turn to Tony Clifford, who is the CEO for Standard Solar. And as Rowan was saying, the the tax incentives um, have been terribly important for a lot of member companies of the Solar Energy Industries Association. And our subsidy system is so skewed, and it does make one wonder why we keep subsidizing those things that actually are creating some of our problems while we really need to be making sure that we're creating uh, and transforming our energy economy. So, Tony? Thanks, Carol. And you can come here or sit there. Oh, I'll just sit right, right here. This is very comfortable. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about Standard Solar. Roan referred to the company a couple of times, so I should give a little bit of background. Uh, we're just about four years old now in terms of how long we've actually been in commercial operation. Our first customer is here to my left, Roan Resch. Um, but in the last, yeah, there were, Roan was literally our first customer when he had his residential system installed. Uh, since that time, we've done close to 700 residential systems. We've done um, 
all sorts of uh, commercial and government buildings, the roof of the Department of Energy headquarters. We've done recently finished four buildings uh, at Catholic University, System at American University, a bunch of buildings uh, in the area. We also recently won a contract to provide up to six megawatts of uh, of PV to the University of Delaware over the next three years, and that will be the largest uh, individual installation at any college or university in the United States. So we're a company that started out in the residential business, and, have it, and that is still a very important business for us, but we've also expanded into, uh, into commercial and larger scale systems. Uh, Roan was talking about uh, the growth in the, the solar industry, and since we started commercial operations, we've managed to triple our, uh, our revenues each year for the last four years. Um, now, 2009 was a downturn. We had projected that we'd do a factor of five in 2009, and we couldn't do it. And the reason we couldn't do it is what Roan alluded to. It's the fact that, um, that uh, the uh, sources of tax equity just weren't there. And some of those sources of tax equity were big banks like Bear Stearns and others that are no longer with us. And so the, that really changed. And the Treasury grant program is absolutely essential. But, uh, you know, we're excited about the future. We've got that factor of five growth that's in for uh, 2010, and we fully expect to meet that hurdle this year. From the standpoint of jobs growth, I joined the company in February of 2007, and this is my second go-round in solar. I was first out of business school in the late 70s. I was with SolarX Corporation, which was the predecessor company to BP Solar. So... When in 2006 I'd sold a company, or 2005 I'd sold a company, I was looking around for what to do next, and oil hit 65 bucks a barrel on the way up. So I thought it might be a good time to get back into solar, and that's how I ended up getting hooked up with Standard Solar. But what I wanted to talk about today, it, it, you know, the, it was pitched primarily as technology, and I think that a lot of the discussions of technology versus, you know, conventional silicon versus thin film and things like that have been really addressed. And what I wanted to talk about was how monitoring systems, which are like an adjunct for solar systems, how they can enhance the customer experience and how they can induce behavioral change. And I had a nice PowerPoint presentation that you'll be able to access. I can give it to you, but I want to talk through it a bit anyway. Now, solar PV systems, they're quiet. They go to work. They save money. They cut emissions. They're designed to be maintenance-free. You just put it on a roof or in the ground and you just pretty much forget about it. If you want to, you can watch it once in a while, but the way the systems are designed, they're designed, especially if you're on a sloping roof, it's no problem. The rainwater will, will, take, care of, will take care of it. But in terms of impacting behavior, I mean, right now you get a, an electricity bill once a month. If you want to aggregate the data for a year, you've got to get 12 months' worth. Maybe you're really efficient and you keep all your bills. You can do that quickly, or you've got to call up the utility. But a once-a-month reminder is not the sort of feedback mechanism you need to induce behavioral change. And what you can do with uh, a solar system is you're going to have daily, weekly, monthly, hourly, however you want to do it, you can be able to monitor your system. And this is the type of information that really changes behavior. We talk about it as the Prius effect. Any of you that own a Prius or any other hybrid vehicle, you've got that big display there. And it tells you what your instantaneous miles per gallon are and what you're doing right now. You try and push that number up a bit. And I went from driving a, a little pocket rocket BMW to a Prius. I really enjoy the Prius. And I try to keep it above 50 miles, you know, 50 miles per gallon. And, but that's really a behavioral change. It absolutely is. And I can remember this guy next to me, uh, sitting in, uh, congressional and DC hearing rooms using his cell phone to call up what a system, uh, is doing right at the moment. I mean, R R Rome, you've done that any number of times, I can, right? I can do it right now, just to give you an example, because I love doing this. Um, this is my phone, and this is technology I've had in my house for four years, and it shows me both not only how much we're generating, but how much we're using as well. So today, we've generated 29 kilowatt hours. We've used 14. So, you know, by the time I go home, I'll have basically a three-to-one ratio on generation towards consumption. And it also shows how much I'm using. So I use this at night to walk around the house and unplug stuff and improve my energy efficiency. So, so Ron, did it change your behavior? Uh, dramatically. Did it change your wife and children's behavior? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, they don't, they don't complain about me walking around and turning off the yeah, light. Right, 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 right. Now, people used to be able to see their meter spin backwards. And, and if we have a customer that still has a conventional meter, then it will spin backwards. And one of the 
those situations we ran into a couple of years ago with a, a local utility that I won't name. One of our customers called up and told me that when she got home, there was a, a utility serviceman hitting the meter on the side with the side of a hammer. And he was hitting the meter because the meter was spinning backwards. And she came up and said, hey, I've got a solar array on the roof, blah, blah, blah. He didn't believe her. He called his boss, and his boss said, is there a solar array on the roof? Yes, get out of there. So, but that's, that, that's, that's, a true, that's a true story. Now, with the new digital meters, rather than getting a positive number, you get a negative number. It's the same thing. Um, and occasionally, we will have a customer that has a zero bill for the month. Boy, does that make them happy. We get, we'll get a copy of that bill in the mail, is, is what it comes down to. And you can monitor the data a bunch of different ways. I mean, every system you get, there's going to be some sort of monitor right on the inverter that shows it. But usually the inverter is, is in your basement or it's on an outside wall. So, you know, that's like the base model. Uh, you can also get a wireless or a plug-in monitor. You can have it fed into your PC. I don't have to talk about having it put into a BlackBerry or an, I, or an iPhone, because Roan just demonstrated that. But you do get instantaneous feedback on this stuff. And, you know, I've got a bunch of charts here that you're not going to see. But basically, what I show is, you know, you can do this, as I said, you get hourly feedback, you get daily feedback, you get monthly feedback, you get annual feedback, and it does change behavior. And we have had instances, and Roan is one of them, but many others, where they will do a system, and you know, you don't want to design the system, uh, well now it's changing some, but you, you want to be sure that you don't generate a complete surplus because most RPS, most of the legislation, uh, the utility has to credit you for the amount you put back into the system, but if you have uh, an annual bill that's negative, they have no obligation to write you a check. So you don't want to sort of, you know, give the man free electricity. So you design the systems to be less. But what happens is in this feedback mechanism, you get people who start having other energy efficiency projects. They start, you know, turning off the lights, doing things like that, and they creep up towards 100%. Or they'll call me up and say, Tony, I'm at 88% of my demand. I want to get to near 100. Can you sell me another 10 panels? That has happened with certain people that we have as customers. So, but this is the sort of thing. I mean, this influences behavior, and it, it's getting the person involved in this stuff. And it's, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to take the place of federal legislation or anything like that. But overall, it really is an important factor in, in, in energy conservation is just having this sort of information available. Now, that's enough that I can say without having the slide. So I, what I'd like to do is maybe talk a little bit about what I think we really need in terms of policy options. And the one that, that Roan talked about, the extension of the Treasury Grant Program, that's absolutely crucial. And that's important for sort of keeping the momentum going. It's scheduled to run out the end of this year. It has virtually no impact on the budget because right now it's, you know, if, if you – if you have a 30 percent tax credit anyway, this is just accelerating the process of getting that money in. So I'm really hopeful that, you know, Congress can sort of find the time in the next few months to actually get something like this passed in an extension bill. Um, also, I think that, um, you know, they took a couple of billion dollars out of the DOE programs for, uh, for the cash for clunkers, and they promised to give it back but they haven't given it back yet. And this is important for getting, you know, additional uh, solar, projects, uh, solar projects in the ground. The other thing that we need is at some point we absolutely have to get some sort of long-term energy program. And I, we, we've got to one way or another recognize the true costs of, uh, of our reliance on fossil fuels. And, I mean, you can point to the blowout of the BP well in the Gulf, and I hate to hear that called an oil spill. It is not an oil spill. It is a blowout of a well. It's 19,000 uh, barrels a day is what I heard this morning, which is up from the 5,000 that they were talking about before. And that's just the beginning. I mean, we tend to forget about these things. Most people forgot there was a mining disaster in West Virginia, you know, six weeks ago. And probably nobody remembers the fly ash uh, disaster in Tennessee last year. But these are things, and they add up. And, it, you know, the only way we're going to get some recognition of, uh, of the true costs of fossil fuels are to do things like impose some sort of a carbon tax. And we, we've just got to move this way because, you know, as Roan said, uh, you know, the, uh, the oil industry has had oil depletion allowances and other things since 1916, 
And with the money, these vast amounts of money that are uh, getting the solar business started, it's like 170th of what the current fossil uh, fuel incentives are. It's absurd. It's completely absurd. So talk to your Congress people about that, because I guess their staff people aren't here today. All right, after that, I'll just take questions after we're finished here. You guys are quite a dog and pony show. I really <laughs> like that with the demos and everything. And as Tony said, we will be putting um, his, his uh, slides up on the EESI website along with, with presentations from other people. And, of course, that website is www.eesi.org. Um, at this time, I would like to turn to our third speaker for this panel, Eric Huffman. And Eric is the Business Development Manager for the Eastern Region for Sun Optics. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And thanks to uh, EESI and, of course, the Sustainable Energy Coalition as well. Great to see so many people here. And as we talked just a minute ago, the, the other halls packed with people uh, much more than last year, in my opinion. It seems like it's very well attended. So appreciate everyone coming out. Hopefully uh, it's been worthwhile and you'll be able to spend some time over at the booths if you haven't been there yet. Um, but as Carol said, my name is Eric Huffman. I, I manage the Eastern Region for Sun Optics. Sun Optics is a skylight company. And you might say, well, why is a Sun Optics, why is a skylight guy here with the uh, PV guys? We're, we look at our product as a passive solar product which just means we don't generate power, but of course we, we are dependent on the sun for our product to work too. So uh, we, we feel we fit in well, and uh, you'll see that in a couple of things that we'll draw out today. But, you know, there was actually a comment made this morning by one of the legislators that got up and it made the brief um, remarks. He said, uh, speaking of the oil spill, he said no one's ever been hurt by a... Spill. That's right. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> that's true. It, that uh, no one's ever been hurt by a, a photon... And, uh, you know, pretty interesting the way he said it, or he actually said photon spill, so it's not a spill. But, yes, uh, you know, it's interesting when you look at these technologies and the reliability and the safeness and the, the way that they work compared to what we are using now, there is a dramatic difference. So the way we look at daylighting, I'll, I'll, let me ask, how many people have skylights in their houses? Okay. All right. Good start. How many people have ever noticed skylights in where they work or where they shop maybe? Pretty much everywhere, right? So uh, the way we look at, it's kind of a terminology thing. We look at we look at skylighting and daylighting, and we feel it's actually two different things. Skylighting is what we just talked about. Hey, I got a skylight in my house, or you know, we got a couple skylights here or there. And I, how many people ever? I don't know if you have a glass skylight and you you get a spotlight of light on the floor, and it just kind of tracks across the floor all day. And if you happen to be sitting there or have a couch there, it just kind of fades it out, and you get kind of like you're sitting in your car when the sun's beating on you. You know, that, that's, that's what, in, in our mind, and what we think about with skylighting. And then when you talk about daylighting, that's when we're, we use that term to describe a way to make the best use of the sun, diffuse it properly in a space, use proper design and layout and techniques to uh, create a pleasant environment to work or live in. And basically the goal is to eliminate the need for electric lights during the day when you're daylighting a space. And therefore, the way it ties in nicely with PV is to not have to generate the power to run the lights during the day. So instead of having to create that power, we can eliminate that need and therefore save that money or use that power in other places to run equipment or computers or whatever else might need to be run in that space. So that's how we feel daylighting works with solar in a passive way because we don't generate power. That's why we call it passive, but that's the way we feel that it works in well with that um, idea. So we look at skylights versus daylighting and then we um, talk about, you know, of course the sun's going to be around for a long time. NASA tells us it should be about another 5 billion years, so we should be able to make use of it at least for a little while and uh, put it to good use and hopefully be able to reduce the demand that we have. There's some, there's actually a, a DOE report. I have some information that I put together that I brought some extras and then we have some at the booth as well. The DOE did a report last in 2008 actually about called the Top Lighting Report where they actually studied top lighting or daylighting of space and how it would affect uh, the, uh, the energy efficiency of space as well as uh, the demand in the country. And if we properly daylit every space uh, that, that potentially could be done, basically single story commercial space was what they were looking at, we could save 117 million kilowatt hours per year. 
So it's a pretty big number. Um, I mean, that would be a lot less money, a lot less power to generate, and it would create significant savings for uh, you know us and what we have to uh, pay for energy. And there was a couple other things that came out in that study about a lot of people have concerns with daylighting about heat gain and heat loss and how that affects you know the power you have to generate for whether it's heating and cooling and how it ties in with the other systems. So. There's a lot that comes into play when you, when you talk about daylighting and doing it properly and how it affects the space that you work or live in. Uh, part, of that, part of what ties into that is uh, a real common question is, well, how can we uh, you know, control the light so we don't get the excessive heat gain? And again, this, this DOE study pointed out that if it is properly done, you actually do not uh, create, you create a net positive uh, gain into the space of it's always better to turn off the lights rather than to run the lights and have to, uh, uh, you control them through an automatic dimming system or automatic control system and allows you to, again, eliminate the heat that you're getting from the lights and reduce the heat gain into the space. The technical term that, they, that you'll hear about it is you'll get half the heat gain from the natural light than you will from the electric light. So you're actually gaining less heat into the space. And they studied in both uh, Vermont and in Phoenix, Arizona. So it was a well-documented study, a lot of good information in it. Uh, that has application for those in commercial space that they're trying to daylight. Now, there's other studies that you might say, well, hey, how's this affect me? There's a lot of studies that go into not only commercial space, but also how daylighting affects us and how we interact with daylighting and what it does in the environments that we work and perhaps where your kids might go to school uh, and how it affects us in those environments. So there's a lot of information out there about uh, the studies that have been done. Uh, one, for example, references uh, schools that are daylight versus non-daylight schools and how those kids will perform in those schools versus uh, kids in the non-daylight schools. And generally, they have better test scores. They have better attendance. They usually grow taller, have less cavities. There's a lot of things to get attributed to daylighting. Now, we don't typically use those as sales points just because it's hard to quantify some of those, but that information's out there. Uh, and what it might mean to you is in your school district when they're considering daylighting or building new schools or modifying an existing school, how that would, uh, you know, perhaps create what you would recommend or what you would like to see your, your, your own children studying in what type of environment. You know, simple things like introducing some skylights into a space sounds like, well, that's not a big deal. You know, we probably don't need to bring that up. I'm sure the architect already knows about that. You know, that might be the case, but as you voice your opinion and, and let them know what's important to you, there are some simple things that make a big difference. Um, now, it's, uh, and, and it's the same goes in your work environment. You know, I don't know how many people work in a, in a non-daylight environment, but there is that opportunity when you can work in a nice space. And well, it, it generally comes down to a simple matter. Would you rather work in a basement or would you rather work in a, in a window uh, window environment? And it is that matter. It, the, what the studies show is how we are more productive, less absenteeism, uh, better health uh, reports. So there are a lot of things that tie in with daylighting that make sense. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, how it ties in with solar and PV and generating power, but there is an important benefit to uh, using daylighting, maximizing uh, proper design in your space. Now, daylighting only needs in our typical design, we, we only need a very small footprint on the roof, typically 5% or less. So we, we do many projects where we tie the two systems together, both in uh, for daylighting and PV or uh, wind or whatever someone else might be trying to put on the roof in order to um, you know, create the most uh, positive environment, whether to work or to generate power or to save power in their, in their business place. So the basic message with daylighting is just reducing your consumption by turning off your electric lights, being able to do that in a controlled manner, whether it's automated or not. And our, our, our most famous client that we work with is Walmart. They daylight every space. We've done over 3,000 of their stores. And we're not bragging about what we do, but what Walmart has done and what they've studied in building design and their construction methods, they, they typically turn off their electric lights about 3,000 hours per year per store. So a typical return on investment for that type of property is less than two years. So there's significant savings by daylighting space, and then that goes right to the bottom line. So for those that are, that are in business or in the commercial environment, you know, it's a very typically uh, – you know, simple technology that gets overlooked often, but as you can see with that quick demonstration, there are a lot of opportunities there for savings with daylighting. So, thank you very much. And I, I think, Eric, you know, once, once again, that just shows, you know, in terms of 
the business case that can be made over and over again. Um, and in our previous session, uh, we were talking a little bit about buildings, and obviously this is an important piece, just like with PVs and uh, solar water, et cetera, how they all can help buildings be zero net energy and produce everything that they need and, and perhaps more so as we really think about how we design and, and redesign our built environment. So let's open it up for... All right, this is wow. great. Well, let's see, Richard, I'll start over here in the corner first. Um, on the issue of global competition, I think here you mentioned China, and um, I didn't understand because they dominated the sort of technology, not only in the mass volume and installation, but the uh, next generation of technology. And the second question I have, if you allow me, is we also talk about uh, stimulus money. What happens when the stimulus money drives out then? Okay, great questions. Um, first one, China. Um, I'm happy to say that for most of your um, conceptions uh, or, or, or thoughts on China um, is not quite accurate. Um, the United States invented photovoltaics about 54 years ago out of Bell Labs. Uh, we were the largest manufacturer of photovoltaics up until uh, 1997, and then we lost leadership to Japan. And uh, in fact, it really wasn't until this last year where the Chinese actually achieved a, uh, a significant presence in the sense of number of manufacturers. And they've been, it's been coming for a long time, there's no doubt. And their manufacturing capability is, is outstanding, just in the sense of volume, uh, in large part because of the subsidies that they receive from the Chinese government and the provincial governments to encourage new manufacturing. And there, there's unbelievable subsidies. Um, so it's difficult for us to compete in that kind of environment in the sense of manufacturing. Uh, but having said that, the manufacturing tax credit that was created in the Recovery Act um, was actually supported 60 new manufacturing facilities here in the United States. So there's at least 60 new plants under construction this year to produce solar in some capacity, right? They could be mirrors for the big utility scale stuff or it could be photovoltaic panels, everything kind of in between. So that's great to see. It's amazing what just one little incentive will do in order to spur the investment here in the United States. What we're also seeing is a lot of the Chinese invest in the U.S. with respect to new manufacturing facilities. So SunTech is opening up. They're one of the largest manufacturers in the world. Uh, new York Stock Exchange traded uh, company that's Chinese headquartered, they're opening up a facility just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And you're seeing similar plans from Yingli and Trina and a bunch of others. Um, so that's very encouraging, at least to open up the manufacturing here. Uh, on the technology side, though, the United States still dominates, um, I'd say without question, not only on the efficiency, but also on the manufacturing side. Uh, applied materials, uh, as an example of one company that makes equipment that manufactures solar, uh, Spire and others are still kind of viewed as the world standard for uh, high quality, low cost uh, uh, equipment. Certainly the Germans and the Swiss make great equipment as well. Uh, but when it comes to panel efficiency and panel technology, I would say it's the United States and the Germans um, that really dominate that sector and will continue to. And certainly the next generation of you know, thin films or higher efficiency panels are coming out of the United States, Australia, Germany, and Japan, less so from China. China's more the low efficiency, low cost producer uh, for solar panels. Um, your second question is what happens to the industry once the Recovery Act dollars dry up? Well, a lot of the Recovery Act dollars went to um, basically to government procurement or to um, uh, rebuild schools or other buildings that basically solar had an option as one of the options for, for inclusion. And so we've seen a fair number of projects that have included solar, which is great. Um, You've also seen, you know, some of the changes like the Treasury grant program and the manufacturing tax credits. Uh, there's a real impact on the industry if the Treasury grant program um, expires. And the reason why is the Wall Street hasn't come back. The tax equity markets aren't there. There's new players that have come in, but still we're looking at a fraction of, of, of the amount that's needed for solar and wind. And just to give you a sense, I mean, you know, we talk about a 30% tax credit, fine, you bring in an investor who can use it. Well, there's a transaction cost for that. 
And what we're seeing now is that over 50 percent of the value of that tax credit gets consumed by the, the equity investor in that project, the tax equity investor. So we, what it meant basically is that a 30 percent credit that was intended to build projects, over half of that was going into the, you know, to line the pockets of Wall Street investors. Now that's crazy. So we need a mechanism that puts the money into the projects, and that's a Treasury grant program. So uh, hopefully we'll see that extended. I just add a little bit to what Roan said, and that is that when you look at some of the advances in technology, the leading thin film company in the world right now is First Solar. They're an American company. The amount of venture capital that has been put into other, you know, competing new technologies in the United States is staggering, and it's far greater than what's going on anyplace else in the world. So I think if we end up with a reasonable sort of policy framework that will support this stuff, we're going to do okay once the stimulus money runs out. If I could add just one thing about um, there's, there, there is no incentive for daylighting currently. So if, when, if you talk to your congressman, uh, it, it, it is something that we are lobbying and trying to push that agenda. I should say there, the only daylighting incentive currently available is for a fiber optic skylight, which has virtually no application for practical use. Um, it's it's a really neat product. I, I don't I, you know I've seen it. it. It does work. But anyway, just if if you do happen to uh, run into your congressman or a staffer, you might mention how daylighting could save a 117 million kilowatt hours per year. It 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 would be significant. Okay, here first. Uh, that yeah, yeah. Could you read? Sometimes. Yeah. Basically, in certain states, in many states, the homeowners associations have uh, covenants that could effectively allow your neighbors to bar you from putting up a, uh, a, a solar system of any sort. Uh, that Those things are outlawed in some states, but in many states they're not, and there is a move to try and get some sort of national standard. We've had it in several pieces of legislation, and certainly if we see an energy bill this year, we'd expect to see it included as well. There's very little opposition to it. Um, just to give you a quick little anecdote, when uh, Al Gore decided he wanted to put solar panels on his house in Tennessee, he wasn't allowed to. The Homeowner Association <laughs> restricted him for doing so. Obviously, he filed an appeal, and within six months, they reversed it. But that's a major institutional barrier that prevents a lot of people from going solar. You're right. Uh, over here first. You're talking to various policymakers about extending and changing some of the incentives that are available. Are, are they hearing you talk about what's happened in, in Germany with the vegan tariff and the result of the supply chain here in the U.S.? I mean, the ripple effect that we have seen in the industry that we're building projects here in our smaller market are significant. They're based on a policy change that happened in Germany. And, and I'm just curious if, if you're seeing politicians listen to that as an example of a uh, the question was, was based on um, uh, basically the feed-in tariff in Germany, which is a policy structure that gives you a guaranteed rate based on uh, each kilowatt hour you generate and um, you know, multiple technologies and structures and all. Um, and the Spanish model really was probably a disaster in the way the policy was structured. It was over-incentivized. It overheated the market. The government put a hard cap on it and subsequently you know, pummeled the PV market, and it's a large part of why we've seen the price come down by 40 percent in the last 18 months, which is ultimately good for a consumer, just bad for business, you know, certainly trying to sell into that market or operate in that market. Uh, I, I think there is a, a pretty good realization of policy structure and design about what's worked, what doesn't work, and then ultimately um, you know, we need to take a cost-based structure, which we have right now in a, in, a, in a federal investment tax credit, and turn it into a performance-based structure. And that comes more in um, either a, re a national renewable portfolio standard with a, a DG carve-out uh, or with a carbon cap-and-trade program where you can monetize the carbon-free credits that you would generate as a homeowner or as a business owner uh, to be able to sell those into the market. And that ultimately is the stream where we need to go to from a cost-based uh, incentive. And I think people recognize that. But I think there's also 
um, uh, increasingly an acute awareness. You can't have subsidies that turn on and turn off and turn on and turn off and expect to play in a global market. Um, you know, to go back to the first question, the Chinese, they don't have much of a market yet, but they're selling into the global market. And, um, you know, I think ultimately they are going to have a very large market. They have a feed-in tariff, and they'll be buying a lot of their own panels. We're, we're not going to be able to compete in what is clearly going to be one of the greatest economic opportunities of all of our lifetimes if, if we don't have any kind of policy stability. Now, remember, the Germans have this policy in place for 20 years. You know, I mean, we're not great in the United States about long-term strategic planning. We're really good at reacting to crises and doing those kinds of things, although maybe the Gulf of Mexico isn't a good example right now. But it does certainly – you know, we're good at, at responding to crises. So hopefully uh, we won't get to that point where we're in a crisis in the industry before they extend the, the, the programs. Okay. Um, clear in the back first. Just a quick question for Ron. Can you comment on the growth of the uh, solar thermal, the hot water industry, and also any efforts or success or traction you've had in getting legislation which would build into the code that new construction would require, for example, the solar hot water, which is a cheaper and more efficient uh, solar option? Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, so solar water heating is, is, a, is a very cost-effective technology today. Uh, we saw the solar water heating industry grow by about 10% in 2009. Uh, we found that it's one industry that, frankly, is, is, is impacted by a downturn in the economy. So even though solar water heating went up uh, by, by 10%, um, another segment of that, which is solar pool heating, which actually has, from a BTU perspective basis, a much greater impact um, uh, on, the, on displacing fossil fuels, uh, will actually fell by 10 percent. Now, there's no subsidies for, for uh, solar pool heating, but there are for solar water heating. Um, that is an industry that's poised for great growth this year. There's new programs, not only in, in Hawaii, but in California in particular, and, and some northeastern states where solar water heating is allowed to qualify for the renewable portfolio standard. So uh, I mean, we fully expect that industry to, to, to double this year as well. Um, we'll have to see how, how that takes shape. Um, your, your, la your second part of your question was? Uh, that's right. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Obviously, they're revising the building codes now, and, and, and we're certainly trying to get that uh, in place. A mandate to use solar water heating probably won't occur on a national basis in the United States, um, uh, unfortunately, although it is occurring on a state-by-state -state basis. In Hawaii, every home uh, that's built has to have solar water heating. Uh, you certainly see that in Israel and Spain and Portugal and other countries. Um, uh, but there's no reason why it couldn't be required here. It's just that command and control um, appetite of Congress probably doesn't exist as much today. What we'd like to see in the building code, though, is at least you're building in the copper piping into the new home construction so that it's a viable option if the consumer wants to do it at some point in time. So you don't have to build it on the outside or split open your walls. You're just building a, a conduit, if you will, from the roof we to have, the base. We have tried to preach to home builders about making your homes solar ready and consider siting and consider having the, the at least the chaseway so you can run the stuff from the roof, whether it be for solar thermal or PV. Right, an important thing. O over here first, we've just got a couple minutes left, okay? Just the, uh, the idea of um, charging EVs with sol through solar in residences or institutions, uh, electric vehicle charging oh. through solar uh, panels. Uh, and, but also through household and institutional uh, rooms. You know, we have been approached by a number of companies that are developing solar chargers of or charging stations of various types for solar options. There's some stimulus money for that, and that stuff is ongoing. I mean, I think that you're going to really see that uh, more and more as we start getting some real uh, penetration in the electric vehicle market, like when the Volt comes out in the fall. We're going to start seeing stuff like that. Our chief technology officer has a PV system, and he, he has a Prius that's uh, tricked out with uh, a lot of additional <laughs> batteries, and he can go 180 miles or something like that without a charge. And he's got a charging station at his house. But it, it's really just beginning. We, we, we uh, put solar on now with the anticipation of having an electric vehicle. In oh, we'd be happy to sort of put a little hookup in your garage or whatever. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Business opportunities on the way. All right, right here. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Talk fast and you can both go. Okay. Uh, solar thermal credits. What is the legislation for that? Is it state by state? You know, you can get solar thermal credit for EV, but not for solar thermal. And that's a big So, so uh, if, if, if I understand your question right, um, solar Rex, S Rex, um, solar thermal Rex. So, can you describe your question a little bit more? Is there a particular state that you're? Let's say the state of Maryland, D.C., Virginia, we don't have renewable energy credits for solar thermal, solar water. We're about to. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we, they, we tried this year to get, uh, I'm also president of the regional chapter of SIA for D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And one of the things that as an association we tried to get through in Maryland was an, uh, an adjustment of the state RPS to include solar thermal for credits, for SREX, to qualify for SREX. Uh, we got beat back by the utilities on that one. We did not win it. Um, yeah. And, and we tried. Yeah, it, it did not pass. It did not get out of committee in the Maryland uh, State House. Wow. Yeah, so there's, you know, not everybody loves solar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there's obviously some major players that, that, that keep us beat down pretty hard. Um, uh, but there is legislation offered up by Senator Feinstein for a federal uh, renewable portfolio standard that would allow solar water heating to qualify from California. Okay. <laughs> No, the, the, the highest efficiency solar panel uh, made that's in regular commercial production is from Sun Power Corporation, which is an American corporation. They're between 19 and 20 percent efficient. They're actually manufactured in the Philippines. The highest efficiency for a conventional silicon solar cell uh, is from a lab at the University of New South Wales by a professor named Martin Green, and he's in Australia. Those are the best. Yeah. So, so commercial. You're referring to you're, you're, you're referring to First Solar's thin film panel. Now, that's the lowest cost manufactured panel in the world. Their new factories are manufacturing this at 85 cents per watt. Okay, the commercial rate, the you know, wholesale rate is probably around 210, 215 per watt, something like that. So, you know, they are the by far the market leader. Don't worry about efficiency. It's about cost per watt, ultimately, that you want to see. Now, you don't want to produce a 2% efficient panel. That's worthless. But, you know, once you get above 10%, um, it's really about cost per watt and, and application. So in the case of First Solar, yes, they're using different technology. It's a thin film technology uh, using cadmium and tellurium, and it is a lower efficiency technology, but it's a much lower cost production technology. You then look at crystalline silicon, and there's a wide range of different products there. And as Tony pointed out, the world leader is, is SunPower, and, and, and that's a U.S. company. Now, uh, you know, when you look at the average manufactured uh, wattage in China, I guarantee it's not 15 percent. The vast majority of companies in China are making an amorphous silicon product that, frankly, can't come into the United States, but it's going to probably hover around 6 to 8 percent efficiency. So, uh, yes, there are crystalline silicon products that are made by companies like SunTech and Yingli and Trina that are spectacular, really high-quality products in that 14, 15 percent range, maybe. Um, but certainly, I would say there's a pretty broad spectrum of, of manufacturers and costs, and that the consumer has to decide which one is more, more important to them. I feel very um, regretful that we're going to have <laughs> to end this session, because I know that there are a lot more questions, and uh, it would be great to have uh, further conversation and everything, but I want to thank our speakers. That was thank terrific, you. and thank you all.